<laughs> and again, I, I appreciate it. And, and, and this is this is as my rookie debut. I, I, I want to warn you: there might be some dad jokes in here, some '90s references and things. And I, I appreciate it if you laugh, even if it's not funny. <laughs> okay. So um, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Jason Berg. Um, I'm a native Floridian. I was born in a small town called Sebring, Florida, a couple hours south of here that some of you guys may have heard of. Somebody I've already heard of tonight who was from Sebring, so that's pretty awesome. Um, I moved to Seminole County in 2002, and today I live in Winter Springs with my wife, Melinda, my daughter, Angela, who are here in the front row, and our two Boston Terriers, Kermit and Luna. Um, by day, I work for a company called Flow Sports, and we stream sports media online, but at night, uh, the thing is, I have a confession to make. For a few years now, I've been living a double life. And, it, and it's, it's, been, it's been eating me up inside, and I just need to get it off my chest. By day, I'm a mild man and software engineer, but at night, I become history man. Okay? So, it's taken over my life, and it's, it's this big obsession, and some of you already have, have been familiar with my work, but Despite my, my daily profession, my, my career of choice, I've long had a, a passion for history and for writing. And for that reason, when I was at Florida Southern College in Lakeland, I majored in journalism and I minored in history. So I've always had this something that I wanted to do with my life, and, uh, and now I do. And I, I blame my wife for this latest obsession because she told me I needed to get a hobby, and I did, and now it's completely taken over my life. But it is what it is. So, I, I like to write stories about Central Florida history. Uh, sometimes I'll write stories about social justice. It's also a passionate, passion of mine. And sometimes I write stories that are about a little bit of both. And maybe some of you guys are familiar with my work. If not, please check them out at FloridaHistoryBlog.com. My Facebook page is Facebook.com slash History, And many of you know the Sonoma County uh, Florida History group on Facebook. So check those out when you get home. Well, without further ado, let's dive into the feature presentation tonight, and that is Making a County. This is the story of the founding of Seminole County in 1913, and its bitter divorce from Orange County. And that, that separation between the two counties really was very bitter, which is, which is crazy now to think about because today we're all such good friends and partners. Maybe you work in Seminole County and you live in Orange County or vice versa, uh, and even looking at the map, the, the counties look really familiar, uh, really friendly, right? I mean, Orange County's like reaching up around Seminole County, giving it a little hug, and Seminole County's nuzzled in there. It looks like they fit together, but it wasn't always like that. And in fact, 100 years ago, the relationship between Sanford and Orlando was quite the opposite. And it really bordered on hatred, and that's not much of an overstatement. But to understand the root of all that hatred, we have to go back to the beginning. Why was there this rivalry? Well, that it started, the beginning of it started in 1821. So let's, let's start there. 1821 was the year that Florida joined the United States as a territory. It was previously part of Spain, as you know, and was, was, was treated, ceded by a treaty in 1821. At that time, there was only two counties in the entire state of Florida. And they were roughly equivalent with West and East Florida, which were the old Spanish provinces. Um, but when it became a territory, they became Escambia County in the west and St. John's County in the east. Of course, we're in St. John's County. The two counties were separated in the middle by the Swanee River. At that time, there was hardly anybody who lived in this part of state, except for Seminole Indians and runaway slaves and things of that nature. All of the population center was pretty much to the north of Gainesville, which is at roughly that yellow line there. So in 1824, they realized that a county that was made up of the entire peninsula of Florida was entirely too much for one county seat to manage, so they split up St. John's County into a number of other counties, including Mosquito County. Not the best name, but that was the name of the county that we are in right now. So that, that was formed in 1824. So you see Mosquito County was massive. It, it stretched all the, way, uh, down, all the way from Palm Coast and Flatco County down to Palm Beach. Um, so it, it was still a very big county, but the thing is only a few hundred people lived there, so it, it, was, it was okay. Um, the year before that, there was something else interesting that happened, and that was the Treaty of Moultrie Creek in 1823. And what the Treaty of Moultrie Creek did was it was an agreement between the Seminole Tribe and the U.S. government. 
And so what they did, what the U.S. government agreed to do is carve out a, a reservation for the Seminoles in the middle of the state. They were very careful not to give them any coastline, but they gave them a large territory that stretched all the way from Ocala down to Lake Okeechobee. Which at first, it seems like that was pretty generous of the federal government to do, right? I mean, that's a big territory to give the Seminoles. Unless you consider the fact that they used to have the entire state, which we took from them. So I guess it's all about your perspective on things. But regardless, uh, they had this territory which was right up against uh, our, our borders, and in fact, was part of Western Seminole County was in that Seminole territory. But even so, the Seminoles roamed freely all through this land. They, they didn't have, technically their borders were well away from the St. John's River, but they went to the St. John's and they used it as a highway to go north and south. They followed game. Um, this was their territory. There was no border guards back then, no, no border crossings. It was quite poor. So there was no border wall. I mean, the Seminoles may have paid for it if we would ask nicely, but I'm, I'm guessing probably not, right? But regardless, the, the boundaries change frequently, and Seminole County comes by its name for good reason, because this was the Seminole's territory. Consequently, no white settlers lived in this area at that time. In fact, in 1830, only 15 households and 733 people lived in all of Mosquito County. And remember how big that was from the map earlier. Later that year, in 1830, something else happened, and that was Andrew Jackson was elected president which was seen as problematic for the Seminoles, because if you remember, Jackson led the first Seminole War. He was the general who, who, who led the incursion against the Seminoles. So they weren't too happy when he took office, and he proved them right, because soon thereafter, he passed the Indian Removal Act, which basically said to the Seminoles, hey guys, remember that treaty that we signed with you like seven years ago? We gave this reservation. We're not really feeling that anymore, so we're gonna, we're gonna take that back, and you have five years to go to Oklahoma. So that was what they were facing. And most of the, the chiefs of the Seminoles agreed. They knew the, the writing was on the wall. They knew what was going to happen if they didn't go. So most of them packed up and left town and went to Oklahoma. But some of them resisted. Um, remember back then, the Seminoles weren't, they weren't a single tribe. They were really a bunch of smaller tribes, right? Um, so a lot of them resisted, including uh, the war leader, Osceola, who's famous. And that was the beginning of the Second Seminole War. As a result, excuse me, as a result of the Second Seminole War, the U.S. government put forts down the middle of the state, including three forts through our three counties. And there was the, pro the primary force. There were other forts, but these were the primary ones: it was Fort Mellon near Sanford, Fort Maitland, and then Fort Gatlin to the south of Orlando. So that was the first real movement into this area by by white settlers. Granted, they were military. Uh, but as a result of that war, that 733 people we talked about 10 years ago in 1830 dwindled down to 73 people in Mosquito County in the 1840 census. So everybody left. The attacks by the Seminoles were very frequent. But two years later, the Seminoles had been significantly beaten back, and they were mainly constrained down to the territory between Naples and Lake Okeechobee. And their numbers were down. And we think of the Seminoles today as an Everglades people, like a swamp dwelling people, but that they really weren't. They were really from Georgia and North Florida, and they just became swamp dwellers out of necessity because we pushed them back and pushed them back until they had no other place to go. But regardless, in 1842, the U.S. government was beaten down, the Seminoles were beaten down. The U.S. government had spent more money on the Second Civil War than they did the American Revolution. So everybody was done fighting. So both sides just kind of gave up without any kind of treaty. And that was the beginning of the, the true settlers here in Seminole County. In 1842, the Armed Occupation Act accelerated that growth because it basically gave you free land. So what you had to do is to come in, set up a homestead, uh, defend that homestead for five years, and you get 160 acres for free. It was a great deal. And there's plenty of land to be had in the newly opened territory where we live today. So in, in 1843, the county seat was Enterprise, which was just across Lake Monroe from us near Deltona. Um, but that didn't last very long because quickly Mellonville, which is the precursor to Sanford, started to take precedence and it became the commercial center of this area. And so um, it became the county seat in 1845 and, and that growth was accelerated by the fact that they set up a ferry that crossed Lake Monroe, which made access to this interior region a lot easier. 
So Mellonville had leftover uh, barracks and, and things from the, from the old fort. So they had uh, eight two-story buildings that became some of the first uh, tr trading posts and households, and then they had the old fortress itself. And a nice little town started to develop around, around Mellonville. Uh, you can see where Mellonville is on the map in, in yellow. Uh, it's just a mile to the east of downtown Sanford today, and there's Fort Mellon Park there if you want to go visit the old site of Mellonville. And then two miles south of that is Fort Reed, which is on Mellonville Road. And Fort Reed was the second town to develop, and it, was, it became kind of the commercial center where Mellonville became kind of the transport center. So everybody came by steamboat to Mellonville and then headed down the road to Fort Reed. So in 1845, uh, Mellonville was now really a county seat, and Florida became a state, became the 27th state in the Union. Other notable things happened that year. They shaved Mosquito County in half and formed St. Lucia County on the south. And also, finally, and thank goodness, they renamed Mosquito County to the much more tourist-friendly name, Orange County. <laughs> thank goodness they did, because I don't think Disney would have put his state parks here. So what about Orlando? We've talked all this time about Melville, about all these things, and we haven't yet mentioned Orlando, and that's because Orlando didn't exist. It wasn't even a figment of anybody's imagination at this point. What we had is we had a region that was generally known as Fort Gatlin, which was the southern half of the county. Uh, Fort Gatlin was on this little peninsula, as you see in yellow, um, on Lake Conway, and the people who lived in the vicinity of Fort Gatlin just kind of called it Fort Gatlin, but there was, there was no town. There was, there was nothing really but settlers who happened to live within a few square miles of each other. In 1843, uh, a settler came by the name of Aaron Jernigan came in, and in, in old maps you might see the town of Jernigan in the 1850s. That's because Aaron Jernigan uh, petitioned for a post office and got a post office in 1850, but that post office was just out of his home where he had a trading post. There was absolutely no town, so despite it being on the map, there was no town. Where, where Orlando is today is a bit to the north between Lake Eola and Lake Lucerne, about six miles north, but there was absolutely nobody that lived there. Again, there was just kind of scattered settlers throughout the entire area. So in 1856, we have the first battle between Sanford and Orlando. Neither Sanford or Orlando existed by name at this point in time, but regardless, between the two regions of settlers, this was the match. And the match was between two cousins. It was spearheaded by Judge James Spear and Dr. Albernon Spear. See I think Spear, spearheaded. <laughs> So Judge James Beard, uh, he, was, uh, he was a recent settler at that time in 1856. He had moved to Fort Gatlin in 1854, and he was a judge and an attorney. And he came in at a very, very good time for him because about the time that he was coming in, Aaron Jernigan was going out. Aaron Jernigan was the leader of the community, but he was brought up on murder charges and all kinds of craziness, which would be a whole other presentation, but he left town, and Judge Spear came in, and he filled that back and he became the town leader. To the north, his cousin was Dr. Algernon Spear. <laughs> this is an actual picture of him. No, this is actually Dr. House. I mean, there's, no, there's no picture of Dr. Spear, so we're gonna have to house agree to stay in it for him. <laughs> uh, but he came in in 1843, and he moved to the area of Fort Reed. And, uh, and he planted the first citrus groves in the county, which is a huge deal, obviously. And he carried a lot of wealth and political clout with him, especially because he married into the family of the founder of Jacksonville. So he was kind of a big deal. Not really. <laughs> so uh, what we had in 1856 was a three-way battle. There was another town to the west called The Lodge, and The Lodge was actually now known as Apopka. There was a small community that developed around the Masonic Lodge there, and it was called The Lodge, and that, uh, that movement for the county seat to be there was led by Isaac Newton, not Sir Isaac Newton, but Isaac Newton nonetheless, and we've already talked about Judge Spear in the south and Algernon Spear, Dr. Spear in the north. So, as a, as a child of the 90s, when I thought about these battles between Sanford and Orlando, I was like, round one, fight. And, and this is <laughs> Mortal Kombat, if you didn't grow up in the 90s, I apologize. This is what I pictured in my head. So we've got Dr. Spear and Judge Spear going at each other. Boom, right? Wow. So here's the deal. This was not even a good match. Uh, Dr. House was gonna just destroy it. It, it, was, it, was, it was sealed, the fate was done because Fort Reed had far more population. They were already the county seat. They had the commercialization. 
They had the transport. Remember, Orlando, there was no railroads back then, right? So how could you get to Orlando where you had to ride into Sanford on a steamboat and they had to take a full day ride down Sandy Trails to get to Orlando? Why in the world would it make any sense for that region of the county to be the county seat? It didn't. And besides that, it was a vote. It was a popular vote. So Fort Reed was gonna win just by nature of having more people, right? Well, nope. Uh, Judge Spear and Fort Gatlin pulled it out. How in the world could a non-town with less population beat the existing town? Well, Florida <laughs> has had their share of shady elections, and this was maybe the first. So what Judge Spear realized being an attorney is that he knew the law very well, and soldiers were permitted to vote wherever they happened to be on election day, okay? Now, Fort Gatlin itself was decommissioned in 1849, so there was no soldiers at Fort Gatlin, but there were soldiers in other parts of the state. So Judge Spear said, I know what to do. He threw a party. He invited all these soldiers to come in from other regions. He threw this big banquet and said, hey, while you're here, why don't you cast your ballot for Fort Gatlin? And that's what they did, and that's how Orlando stole the county seat from Sanford area for the first time. So you can imagine the bitterness that welled up around that, but there was also a question that welled up as a result. There was no town of Orlando, there was no town of Fort Gatlin, there was no town of Jernigan. Where were they gonna put the county seat? Where were they gonna put the courthouse? They needed a town. It just so happened conveniently that Judge Spear also owned some land on the banks of Lake Eola. And so the, the, there was a trail that led from Mellonville to Fort Gatlin that, that also passed by that same spot. And so Judge Spears said, hey, why don't we put it here and I'll donate the land for the courthouse. So that's what they did. And th this is what Orlando looked like shortly thereafter, a couple years later, when they had just the beginnings of a town. You see on the, uh, the bottom here, uh, this Ford courthouse, first courthouse here, it was the only existing, uh, it was the only existing building in the area. It was just a single room log cabin. And that was the first courthouse. And then soon thereafter, they built the second courthouse, which is basically like a, a three-frame wood room. And that was all there was to Orlando. Not very, not very much, not a very impressive county seat. And by the way, Lake Lucindy here now is known as Lake Lucerne, just so you have a little bit of context of where you're looking at. And this is, it's maybe not literally, but roughly like Roslyn, if you know downtown Orlando. And this, of course, Melonville Trail led up to, to Melonville. So that was all there was to Orlando. And again, it didn't exist until the fact that they got the county seat. A year later is when it actually got its name. Orlando, which is a controversy in itself that we won't get into, but it was named by Judge Spear in 1857 as Orlando. So in the years after that, remember we're getting to the 1860s, so if you know your history, you know that was a civil war. And following the civil war, there was the reconstruction, and that was really rough on the economy of this area. So not a whole lot happened over the next decade or so, except for the fact, let me actually go back a slide here, except for the fact that that courthouse that we just talked about I can't go back. There we go. This, the courthouse was burned down in 1868, which was a disaster from a historian's perspective because we've lost so many vital pieces of the early county history when that fire happened. But other than that, not much happened until 1870. In 1870 is when Henry Sanford arrived in town. And so obviously Henry Sanford is the namesake of the town of Sanford. And he was a big deal. He was famous. He was wealthy. He was everything. Uh, he spoke with a European accent. He had spent so much time abroad. He had millions of dollars. He always dressed poshly to the nines. He spoke very eloquently. He was very much an outsider, but his money was very much needed. Um, he was appointed as the, uh, by Abraham Lincoln as the U.S. foreign minister to Belgium. So he, again, he was, he was famous. And he invested in a lot of territory in the state of Florida and finally really fell in love with the Lake Monroe area, about 23 square miles to the west of Mellonville on, on Lake Monroe. Um, a lot of land, and he, and, he, and he brought in some immigrants, and he invested in orange groves and all kinds of other things. Um, but nobody thought very much about it at first. They didn't realize his whole ambition. They thought maybe he invest money in Mellonville, and Mellonville would get bigger. But what they didn't know is Sanford had in mind that he wanted his own city, and he wanted his name to be cemented into history. And quickly, the city of Sanford developed as a separate town and overshadowed Mellonville and Fort Reed. So by 1875, Sanford was pretty well established. It had utilities and lights and, and sidewalks and all kinds of stuff that we take for granted now, but it was a huge deal back then. And they had this massive hotel that he built there in 1875 
uh, which became a huge center. And Orlando had nothing like that. Orlando was this backwoods town, right? So Sanford rightfully thought, why would we have this backwoods town? There's no railroad still, so it's still very hard to get to. Why would, why would Orlando be the county seat? Sanford needs to be the county seat. So he started a campaign to move the county seat to Sanford. Made a whole lot of sense. So this sets up our, our second round two. Round two. Fight. <laughs> Between Henry Stanford and Jacob Summerlin. Who is Jacob Summerlin? Maybe some of you guys have heard of him. He was pretty much the polar opposite of Henry Stanford. Sanford was proper and posh, and, and Summerlin was as cracker as cracker can get. He was born in the state of Florida. In fact, they say that he was the first child born in the Florida territory of when, when, once Florida became a U.S. territory. So he had been here all his life. He had worked his way up. He had, he had, had tens of thousands of heads of, head of cattle. He was a millionaire by the time he was, he was 40. He was a big deal, but he was country, right? And so in the recent years uh, leading up to 1875, he had gotten an interest in Orlando. He moved from Bartow to Orlando, and he bought some real estate here, and he bought, built a hotel here. So here is our round two between Henry Sanford and Jacob Summerlin. So what's going to happen next? Well, Henry Sanford was lobbying really hard for the county seat. He was talking to the county commissioners, and they were kind of on board, but he couldn't get them to commit. And he kept hearing about this Jacob Summerlin as a thing that was standing in his way. So Sanford got into a horse and carriage. He headed down to Sanford, and on the banks of Lake Yolo was the Summerlin Hotel. This is what it looked like. So Sanford walked into the Summerlin Hotel on the way, and he passed some cowboy that was you know, half asleep on the, on the porch, and he, he demanded from the clerk that he get to speak to this Jacob Summerlin who dare stand in the way of Sir General Henry Sanford. And the clerk said, dude, you just passed him. He was on the porch. And so they took him back out, and he met, they met, the two men met face-to-face -face for the first time. Again, polar opposites. Sanford stood up and eloquently stated his case to Summerlin. Summerlin was, was polite, but kind of just nodded his head and said, well, we'll see you tomorrow at the county commission meeting. So they went to the county commission meeting and both presented their case. Um, Henry had already talked to all the county commissioners and they were on board, they were, they were ready to go. Um, so it was just kind of a technicality. So he came up there and said, hey, I'm gonna invest in this brilliant city with all these millions, it's gonna have paved roads, it's gonna have all these things, it's gonna be like this cosmopolitan thing, it's gonna be, everybody's gonna be jealous, it's gonna be the county seat of the county seats in this area. Done deal, right? Well, uh, so Summerlin basically said, hey, are you done? Are you, have you said all your pieces? He said, yes. And Summerlin stood up and said, look, we've got a perfectly good county seat here. We've got land that was deeded to us for the explicit purpose of being the courthouse. If we don't have a courthouse there, they're gonna have to give it back to the heirs. And here's what I'll do. I'll put up all the money to build a brand new courthouse. And if the county wants to pay me back, they can pay me back. And if not, that's cool too. It's all right with me. County commissioners changed their tune and they said, hey, let's take free money. They did actually end up paying them back in 1870, uh, 10 years later, um, but uh, they built this courthouse on Summerlin's dime and the county seat stayed in Orlando. So in the next few years, uh, in the 1880s, the railroad came, so Orlando was much easier to get to. In the 1890s, we had a terrible freeze that set us all back, you know, a couple decades probably, a lot of people left town. In the 1900s, Things started to trail back up. And San so 38 years later, Sanford was ready to go after their county seat again. But they changed their strategy now. Rather than trying to steal the county seat or move the county seat from Orlando, they said, we're going to form our own county. So they started a movement to secede, uh, to, you know, county division from Orange County and form Seminole County. Now, this effort was led by a man named Forrest Lake. And if you know anything about Sanford, this guy is notorious as they come. And he can have his own presentation. This, he did some good things and he did some really bad things. But he had moved to he had moved Sanford in 1886. Um, he served 11 terms as mayor of Sanford. So he was a big deal in the town of Sanford. And at this time, in 1913, he was serving on the House of Representatives. And uh, just to reiterate the point, like he was a slick politician. He had a way of getting whatever he wanted and the truth was no object to him. He, he, he just made it happen. So round three, I put between Forest Lake and the Orlando Sentinel. And the reason for that was, wasn't necessarily the Sentinel specifically, but this, this war was largely waged in the newspapers. Uh, much like today when the media is where a lot of these things are happen, uh, 
the, the Sanford Herald and the Orlando Sentinel and some of the other papers went back and forth and kind of tooled it out uh, with Forrest Lake kind of leading the charge. So San, the San, Sanford and their crew, uh, not Henry Sanford, but the Sanford people from Sanford, rode around to local cities and they, they stated their case. And, and some of the information they provided was accurate and some of it was completely fabricated. Um, but they, they made their case pretty well. They, you know, depends on who you ask. Orlando, the people in Orlando didn't feel like they made their case very well. In fact, they said, they said all their stats they had were just made up. And the other things that they threw out there like, oh, well, there's other counties with less population than us. There's other counties that are smaller than us was kind of an irrelevant point that really didn't prove the need for, uh, for having your own county. And Sanford also repeatedly said that taxes wouldn't go up. And they said, well, how are taxes not going to go up when you have to build another courthouse? You have to fund another staff. But regardless, they, 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 they led this campaign. And somebody from Orlando, I, thought, I like this quote that I found in, in the Orlando Sentinel. The attorney from Orlando said, I did not hear a single statement uttered that bore the slightest resemblance to a coherent argument. That was his response after hearing the, the Sanfordites speak and state their case. But regardless, uh, oh, one, one more point I wanted to make is that have you ever wondered why Seminole County looks like this? It's kind of awkwardly shaped, right? We've got this little kind of crazy cut out here, and then like Orange County is reaching up here for some reason. You know, why doesn't it look more like that? Well, the, the thing is that they originally wanted it to. Uh, Forest Lake had a lot more ambition. He wanted he wanted a pop on board. He wanted Maitland. He wanted Lockhart. He even talked to Fort Christmas and Bifflo. They they wanted to grab all those rural areas, but most of the areas around that said no way. And here's some newspaper articles for some of these guys. You know, veto plans fight secession. Tangerine, which is over by Apopka, uh, Zellwood, you know, they're going to fight. All these guys didn't want any part of it. So Sanford, uh, so Forest Lake carved back his ambitions and drew the boundaries like this, and. It worked. So he, he headed up to, to Tallahassee with his lobbyists, and in, I believe, April 1913, they passed it unanimously, I believe, and Seminole County was born. So after that, the town of Sanford erupted into celebration, and, and there was people filled the streets, and this isn't a picture of that, because you don't see people filling the streets, but this is the town of Sanford about that time. And so there was like a ticker tape parade, everybody's patting the back and, and honking their car horns. It was a big deal. They were happy people. So what do Sanford people do when they're happy? They roll out a cannon. They had a cannon that had been part of every celebration that anybody remembered in the town of Sanford. Uh, some people said it dated all the way back to the Second Seminole War. Some people said that was baloney. But regardless, it had been there for decades. Uh, when the president came to town, they fired the cannon. When the holidays were around, they fired the cannon. So you better believe they're going to fire this cannon with a new county. So they, they got a little overly ambitious. They overloaded this cannon, and the cannon shattered. It cracked into a bunch of pieces. And, I, and at first I thought that was this all was just a fable, but I did uncover some newspaper headlines referring to that. You can see here, talking about Sanford citizens busted their cannon. So it really did happen. And the cool thing is, if you go to downtown Sanford today, there's this... The, this is the Chamber of Commerce, and there's this flagpole that looks kind of unassuming there until you inspect it a little bit closer, and if you kind of turn your head a little bit, you can maybe picture a cannon pointed upwards. The legend has it that this is the remnants of the cannon, that after it, it cracked and exploded, they took what was left in it, dropped it in cement, and turned it into a flagpole. So next time you're in downtown Sanford, check that out. So that's it. That's, uh, that's the story. Seminole County got its courthouse, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have.